Hi, I'm Kelly Cushion, editor of the Trade Tech blog, and I'm here at Trade Tech in San Francisco. We're at the end of day one, and we just had a very lively debate between Michael Levis from the Olympian Group and Jay Muchaswamy, who's a professor at Kent State University. And the debate was over fundamental versus quantitative trading, and I think that it had a pretty good response from the audience, and I uh, just wanted to sit here and talk to you guys a little bit about some of the things you debated. Sure. Um, Jay, you were kind of uh, taking a more controversial stance, I think, for now, um, just because people are not quite with uh, this whole quantitative thing yet. But you think that's going to change in the next couple of years, right? Uh, for the better in the sense that I've always felt that quantitativeness has a ring of objectivity to it, which the fundamentals, uh, the fundamentalists rather, uh, replace it with touchy-feely notions of what's good value for buying stocks. I think quantitative takes that out and makes people more objective. Is objectivity good? I think so. Well, what do you think, Michael? Listen, I, I, I think that the, the business is evolving. So there's, there's a part of it that, that needs this, that is, has grown into our business, and I think will continue. Uh, now, where it goes ultimately and to what degree, that remains to be seen, but I still think it's going to be a, a, a part of the business that we're in. Now, one of the first questions that was asked on the uh, debate was, what does it take to be a good trader? So, uh, Michael, do you want to start by saying what you think? Sure. Well, you know, as I said in the, in the, in, in, inside of the debate, I think that discipline uh, is probably one of the greatest attributes that a good, good trader uh, has. Obviously, experience, uh, intuition, um, knowledge, understanding what he or she is doing, um, this all contributes to that great trading process. And I think if you combine all of these with um, technology to help you and to assist you, I think it's a, it's a winning, winning, winning combination. And what about you? What are your opinions on this? I guess discipline is really important. You've got to have a way to manage your money. You cannot lose your capital. That's one of the sacred tenets of trading. People who lose the capital never uh, are not able to start a new day. But more than that, I think it's also the ability to be completely objective and not get emotionally, uh, to fall in love with the position. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. And, and to some extent, I, I think Michael is uh, in agreement with me on that uh, one tenet. But how do you achieve that objectivity is, is the big question. My, my opinion is that the more reliance you have on the computer, the better. And, now, is that simply because we're all human and we can only remove ourselves emotionally so much and then eventually our human uh, capacity f to be emotionally involved is going to take over? Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, because typical reactions of greed, panic, <coughs> regret, these things are not objective. Uh, to even re regret, which is a major uh, quicksand uh, in, in trading, uh, is to, to, to take it out is to make it yourself objective. How do you take it out? And towards that end, I think uh, reliance on quantitative uh, models helps. See, I, I believe just the, kind of the opposite, because I really believe that you need to take the emotion out of the business without question. Uh, and if you do that, and you look at it from a numbers point of view, you have no issue. For instance, yeah, I, in, in back in 08, when the, when the panic was happening, my head trader at the time came in and she was just out of her mind. Just, And I was like, like what's wrong? Good morning. Um, you know, you have to con you have to stay cool. You have to be in control because the minute you lose that, you're done. Right. So you both agree that you do have to stay emotionally stable, but Michael, you would just say that it is possible to, whereas Jay, you would say it's much easier for a computer to. It's, it's much more desirable that you allow as much of it to be automated. Now, we haven't reached a point where it can be completely automated, like the manufacture of a car, robots do 90%, but someone's got to monitor the robots. So in, in trading, I think, for example, if uh, you look at Michael's outfit, he's still the chief overrider. Uh, will we ever come to a point where the computer will automatically shut off if a trader, if a trade goes bad? Yeah, I think if we can come to a point where the, there's an automatic override with the computer, then we would have reached the holy grail. So what about this uh, whole idea of high frequency trading? I know this is kind of a hot topic and we talked a little bit about it in the debate and you guys both had a spar over it. Um, Jay, you kind of feel like this is something that is really going to take over and, and uh, you know take hold, whereas Michael, you think 
What do you think on, on that? Well, as I said, you know, I think it's scalping. I mean, I, I just think it's, it, it's, it's a much more high volume, high capacity form of scalping. And I, that's what I believe. I mean, is it going to be here? Sure, I think it will continue unless something absolutely monumental happens where it creates this meltdown and then just everybody says, oh, God, I, I don't even want to touch that. But I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, I think with as we evolve as, as human beings and, and as technology is helping us to evolve, I think it's just kind of a, a natural extension of, you know, of what's happening. See, uh, my take on that is that like, scalping in the traditional sense has been around for a long time. 50 years ago, it was the scalpers. Then in the 80s came program trading, which is an electronic form of it. Not quite like high frequency, but pretty close in the sense that people scalp the index versus the futures on a regular 15-minute uh, interval by, look, by having computer assisted uh, by itself. Today, the whole thing has gone just two steps above because uh, people are looking all over the markets. They're looking at dark pools. They're looking at co-location. They're even looking at spoofing, which is an attempt to try to recreate the order books. So many more practices are coming out, and that's why the high-frequency approach has become so much of a paradigm shift. So much of a paradigm shift that not enough people are able to do it on the level that the traditional scalping was done. So I think there is a major paradigm shift underway. But yes, this is irrevocable in my mind. Is it going to get to be permanent? As long as the markets are around, I think this is going to be the theme. But I, I know, who, who am I to tell the whole world uh, that this is it? I mean, I'm not an oracle. But my, uh, the, the, the analysis I did 25 years ago for my PhD suggests to me that uh, the computer has up to now, we ain't seen nothing yet, Kelly. In terms of its potential. <laughs> ain't seen nothing yet. Ain't seen nothing yet. Wow. Well, Michael, uh, speaking of that, um, if we really ain't seen nothing yet and the computer is really just going to grow and keep evolving, what uh, will be the importance or the need for the human element? Well, I think it's going to be very important. And what I wanted to say in, in regard that we ain't seen nothing yet, I think that, in, in fact, tomorrow I'm doing my presentation on multi asset trading. And I'm going to show that really the platforms, technology is helping us to be able to, for instance, now we can trade fixed income, equities, futures, currencies, all in one platform, where years ago we needed either separate platforms and a whole separate brokers at various firms in different degrees doing that. So I think what technology is really doing, it's helping us to become more organized, more focused, have everything right there at our disposal, at our hands, that we can really get in and do this. And I think that this is kind of what's, what, what's really, really helping us tremendously. And it's going to, I think, evolve even more so as, as technology involves. We'll be able to just do things. For instance, I can trade virtually right now on any exchange in the world, any currency, any fixed income, I mean, any future. I mean, it's amazing where even five years ago we couldn't do that. I mean, so, you know, this is what I look at it from the positive point of view. But what about the human element then? Do you think it will continue to evolve? I do, because I, I, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I still think sure. that human beings, uh, there, are, there are cognitive cognitive attributes that we have as human beings that I think you'll never be able to program into a computer. Jay. You see, my take on that is that if you go back to the 50s, the Nobel laureate called Herbert Simon wrote a paper, the brain has bounded rationality, something that uh, when, when, when we think about it, it goes against the grain and rubber what Michael is saying. Because by saying that the human brain cannot be equaled by a computer, uh, Simon actually takes the stance that there might be bounded rationality, but a computer can be made so powerful that it could uh, clearly dominate. Like look at Big Blue, right? Big Blue uh, finally won over the chess game. And so there's always a tension between the, what the computing mind can do in terms of logical chips and the human brain. I think that transition, that phase when we hand it over the computer, is, is a matter of 20 years away uh, in my, my mind. Once that comes, I think, Michael, you, you'll be wrong. You'll be found to be wanting on the judgment about whether the human brain can actually cope with the computer. Well, let me tell you what I, and, I, and you know this, and I know you know it, but you're not bringing it up. The human brain has the capacity, if we develop it to the full extent of all of the computers in the world, we have exactly what it takes, the three of us right here. We could develop our brain to the point that it becomes a supercomputer, that we could do things far beyond what any human being today has done. Einstein talked about that. 
I mean, he, he, he talked about that. A, a number of scientists have talked about that. And I know that a lot of people in Jay's uh, position understand that. But are we teaching people to use the capacity? What do we use? Maybe 2% of our brain? Three at the very, very most? I mean, if you have an incredible IQ, so you tell me. I mean, think about that. If we if we utilize and we were trained to utilize that brain, what do we do? You see, Michael is right in the sense that we use a, a very small portion of the brain. If the brain could be awakened to say 10%, it would all be supercomputers. Right. Uh, in the case of a CPU, as long as the program is pretty good, uh, most of it is being run, uh, being exploited. And so sometimes we have a metric of how much of the CPU is being used. And I think that in the case of awake, awakening the brains, Michael, you entered a very dangerous uh, area here, which implies that you may have to take classes in transcendental meditation and the like. <laughs> uh, but we don't want to get into that. You know, We're talking about trading. So I know in some trading rooms that uh, the bosses actually put in TM-guided music to get them to be in, in tune with the infinite. Absolutely. And, and those things to calm the mind, to make it uh, come alive and use every bit of it. Those are the same principles that we're talking about. How do you awaken the mind? In the case of a computer, it's so much more easy to awaken it because it is a programmable logic chip, you see? So in that sense, I stand fast that the human brain will one day be overtaken by the chip. Now that's actually a major point when we'll come. Ray Kurzweil calls it the point of singularity. He puts a time frame of 2080, by which time I'd probably be dead. You but will. who knows? <laughs> well, Jay, one of the other things you talked about was this sort of psychological revulsion that people have to technology and that that's actually playing a role in why someone like Michael would say, no, no, there has to be humans involved. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean there? Yeah, every time, like, for example, when the first motor car came out, uh, if you ask people, do you want the motor car, they would say, that's the work of the demon. We don't want a car. And we'll still be oh, the you're, bring, you're bringing into a religious, uh, a religious <laughs> aspect of the story well, of the demons. When you say psychological right? revulsion, is exactly that. When something comes that is a new kid in the block that's a bit too much for the average mind to handle, we get that kind of rejection. All I'm saying is, like, we've had that for GPS. It's now become common uh, usage. We are still seeing that happening. Like, for example, medical science, uh, there will come a time, maybe less than 10 years, when you don't go to a doctor with your throat. You go with a DVD of the human genome. It's all sequenced, and the doctor puts some treatment. That kind of me medical treatment is still way too ahead, so it's being partially uh, not accepted by the, the mainstream. So I think that kind of learning is, uh, the word is psychological revulsion because people take time. It's like some people prefer to live in a primitive uh, setup. They think that the horse and buggy combination is better. I happen to disagree. I think the faster we get to the jets and skis era, the better. Are you calling Michael primitive? Well, you said it. Uh, you said it. Uh, so I, I think well. <laughs> All right, let me, let me, let me, my rebuttal here. Let's my rebuttal is that, that <clears throat> I embrace technology. See, Jay's looking for the point of view that I'm not open-minded and I'm not thinking about this. Absolutely not. I embrace technology. I understand he brought the, the analogy of the GPS. Now, the GPS, what it's doing, sure, it's helping people, but it's also, by the same thing, taking the thinking process out of everything. It's like the calculator, what it did. It's what spell check has done. It's like... God, I can't even spell anymore. Because why? Because spell check. You have the calculator. I can't even add or multiply anymore. Why? Because the calculator, the computer, okay? So this is a situation that is, 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 is making us not to think, not to use that brain, not to use our intuition, not to use those abilities that we have that create wonderful things. Because after all, who created the, the computer? A human being with a mind and a thought. No, Michael, once again, you're absolutely wrong. The fact is, those <laughs> things you talk about, the ability to multiply large numbers, to do those uh, busy work things, those are not admirable things. I would rather my child not have to add two numbers, but can fulfill himself in playing the shallow. That's what I think the human soul is about. So on the basis You said of the soul, not the brain. That's different. The soul is a very different. Because we get into the psyche now, we get into a totally different thing. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think both of you actually make great points. Um, I think that, you know, what you're talking about here right now, we could talk about for hours. And uh, thank you. I don't well. need this anymore, but that's all right. <laughs> um, but I'm really interested to follow this debate because, uh, like you said, this is going to play itself out in the years to come. And I think that we should keep regrouping and keep talking about this with the two of you. You're both very strong-minded, and I think you both make really great points. Sounds great. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for sitting and joining in. It was a pleasure being here. Yes, thank, thank you. And we'll, we'll let you guys get away uh, to the cocktail reception now. Thanks.